Hi, I'm Pat Goss, and this is Goss's Garage. Every week we talk about various things that deal with saving money on your automobile by making it last longer and be more reliable. All right, now, what is one of the most critical parts of any modern car? Well, you might be surprised to learn that it is the battery. Hmm. How could a lowly battery be one of the most important parts of a car? Well, you see, modern cars, everything is electrical and just about everything is computer controlled. Now, when you're talking about computers, as you know, with your experience with your laptop or your PC or anything like that, it is so dependent upon power sources. They don't like voltage surges, they don't like brownouts, they don't like all of these things. The reason is that everything in the computer works off of a regulated voltage. Well, the same thing is true on a car. You see, battery voltage goes through the ignition system and supplies power to the car's computer. The car's computer, in turn, takes part of that 12 to 14 and a half volts that you would have from your battery and converts it into a five, five volt reference signal. All right, now what does that mean? Well, that means that many of the sensors on your car are going to be fed this five volt signal. And it's a regulated signal, so it's five volts. Now, that signal goes out to the sensor. The sensor, in turn, based on temperature or pressure or position or uh, flow or movement, some, something causes that sensor to change. And when the sensor changes, it changes that 5-volt reference and sends it back to the computer. Now, based on what the computer sees coming back from the sensor, it tells the computer what to do with fuel or air or whatever it might be controlling. Now, suppose you have a weak battery and the battery is not within the operating parameters. Well, the five volt reference can be upset. That means that signals can be upset that means that the car doesn't run the way it should. You could have warning lights, check engine lights, all of these different things going on, all because of problems with the battery. So, twice a year, ideally, you should have the battery tested. And you should have it tested in the spring before the weather gets hot and in the fall before the weather gets cold. The reason is hot has a big effect on the battery. Cold has a big effect on the battery. All right, now, what are we looking for? We're looking for a legitimate battery test, not some little rinky-dink thing that, uh, you know, most of the free stuff is worth what you pay. So you want to look for a really legitimate battery test. It's going to be done electronically. And uh, it's going to give you a good idea as to the condition of your battery because it's going to give you an actual uh, capacity rating of your battery. And that has to be compared with what the battery is rated at. And either the battery is good, marginal, or fail. Okay. So, whenever we have certain problems on the car, any kind of an electrical problem, any kind of a performance problem, any type of a computer problem, or a check engine light. First part of the test should be to test the battery to make sure that the source of everything that goes on electrically and computer-wise on the car, the source is good. It's capable of doing what needs to be done for all of these electronic things to work properly. 
So it begins with a battery test if you have a problem, and you also have a battery test in the spring and the fall. All right now, in the spring, you're getting ready for really hot weather. Now, a lot of people think that batteries fail in the winter. Eh, they really don't. It's just that the symptoms show up in the winter, and I'll tell you why in just a second. You see, in the summer, the heat is the real enemy of the battery. If you look under the hood of a modern car, you'll probably find your battery is uh, encased in some kind of a cover or something to help keep it cool. Uh, some of them have blankets around them, different things. Do not let your technician throw that thing away when you get a battery replacement. Yeah, I know, they're difficult to deal with. Some of them are a real pain in the tail to get back on and get into position and get adjusted and all that, but they're there for a reason. Believe me, manufacturers don't spend a nickel unless there's a reason. So you take a 10, 15, or $30 part, there's gotta be a really good reason for them to spend that much money on building a car on one part. Okay, so we have the uh, issue with the battery. Gonna have hot weather coming up, hot engine, hot engine bay, all of these different things going on. The heat damages the battery. But in the summer, the engine starts easily because the oil is thin, the temperature is up, and all these things. That's number one. Plus, the higher the temperature of the battery up to a certain point, the more efficient the battery is. So, then comes fall, temperature gets cold, Everybody says, oh, well, my battery failed. You go out to start the car on the first 38-degree uh, day, and it just clicks, or the battery uh, grunts, and that's about it. You say, well, the cold weather killed my battery. No, it didn't. The hot weather killed the battery. And when the cold weather arrived, batteries automatically get less efficient as the temperature drops. So, temperature dropped. Now, the damage that was done during the summer really starts to show up. The battery can't perform because of the colder temperature. So, that's why everybody thinks the batteries fail due to cold weather, but they mostly fail due to hot weather. All right, get the battery tested, make sure that you always keep the battery cable connections clean and tight. Now, why is that important? Well, corrosion and dirt and so on on the battery cable connections cause high resistance, and high resistance reduces the amount of electricity that can flow from the battery, say, to the starter motor. Had a Honda here in the shop uh, last week, had been to another shop, they put a starter on it. They did not. They did not clean the battery. They did not inspect the battery. They did not test the battery. They put a very expensive starter on it. That was because intermittently it wouldn't start. Okay, we get in it, we have a set procedure that we follow, and we always do step number one first. That was to test the battery. When we tested the battery, we found that the battery cables were corroded and so on. And uh, partially because we, we already knew that it was here because the same problem existed after that expensive new starter. It would only start intermittently. So we cleaned the battery cable connections, put protectant on them and so on. And lo and behold, that cured the problem. Now, because this car had relatively low mileage on it, I mean, very low mileage, especially for a starter failure, it's really suspect that it ever needed a starter. 
There was probably several hundred dollars that could have been saved had the other shop simply checked and cleaned the battery cable connections. Now this car was out of warranty simply because of time, not because of miles, because it only had like 20,000 miles on it. So the big thing is make sure that the battery is kept clean. Battery cable connections are kept clean and tight. You can put uh, felt pads under the cables and you can use protectants to help prevent the formation of corrosion. The corrosion occurs because batteries have sulfuric acid in them and when they vent, yes batteries do vent, just because you can't take the stupid caps off doesn't mean the battery is sealed. If the battery was completely sealed, it has a liquid in it, liquids expand when they heat up. If it couldn't vent gases from the inside, couldn't breathe, when the battery heated up, the case would swell up and probably crack open. So yes, batteries are vented. Okay, the vent, the gases that come out have minuscule amounts of sulfuric acid in those gases. Those uh, amounts of sulfuric acid from the inside of the battery, they are heavier than air, they go down around the battery and they may go over the top of the battery, around the posts and so on and this causes corrosion on metal parts. So uh, again, make sure the battery is kept clean and that you have protection on those battery cable connections. All right. Now, another thing to remember here is that bottle of Coke poured onto the top of the battery doesn't do a thing as far as making your battery work better. Now, granted, it may make the cable connections on the outside look better. But mostly what it does is make a gooey, sticky mess of things. Same thing with pouring baking soda and water over the cable connection. Yeah, it makes the connection look better to you. But there's one thing that you have to remember. Electricity doesn't have eyes. It can't see how beautiful your work looks. It can only see the inside of the battery cable and the outside of the battery post where the two come together to form the electrical connection. So in order to clean a battery, you have to remove the battery cables, clean the outside of the battery post, clean the inside of the battery cable, put it back together, and then protect it with a battery coating. Do not use grease. Do not use Vaseline. These things are insulators. And yes, they'll keep the cable looking better. They'll help prevent corrosion. But they also melt and they get down between the post and the cable. And what do they do? They act just like the corrosion does. They form resistance, and resistance restricts the flow of electricity out of the battery. Beautiful looking, no corrosion that you can see, but poor electrical performance. Use a proper battery coating. Now, these things are so important on modern cars. I can't tell you how many cars we get in here in a month that most of the electrical or computer or emissions or performance problems can be traced right straight back to the battery. Make sure your shop understands this and that they start their testing with the battery. All right, let's take a break for a quick pointer from our sponsor, Wins Automotive Products. Wins wants you to know that one of the most critical parts of modern computer-laden vehicles is the battery. But batteries are often neglected during routine vehicle maintenance. 
especially with the popularity of so-called maintenance-free batteries. Corrosion builds up on battery terminals and connectors because of the composition of the battery itself and the environment in which it lives. It's important that battery cable connections remain clean to keep electronic components working properly and prevent damage from voltage surges and arcing. Wynn's battery maintenance kits is a great way to keep your battery terminals and connections clean and trouble free. Wynn's battery terminal cleaner and leak detector formulated to neutralize battery acids, clean battery terminals and connectors, indicate battery acid leaks and battery cracks, prevents corrosion, and to rinse off easily with water. Uh, then Wynn's battery terminal protector pads are designed to prevent battery terminal corrosion and they install easily on top or side terminal batteries. Ask for quality Wynn's products by name at finer shops everywhere. Online, WynnsUSA.com. Also check out our friends at Rock Auto. All the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. Okay, we're back. And a couple more things about batteries. Number one, remember that if you have a battery where you can take the caps off, you don't ever add electrolyte. Yes, you can go to a parts store and you can buy a container of battery acid and uh, try to put it into the battery, but the thing you have to remember is that as a battery works, they have lead plates inside. And the way the battery works is by trading electrons and so on. But what that means is, is that part of the acid in the battery moves out of solution with the water that's mixed with the acid. It enters the plates and that leaves more water and less acid. The con concentration of the water to the acid is different as the battery is used. Now, because you have no way of knowing what percentage of the acid is in the plates and what percentage of it is still liquid in the water that you see in the battery, if you take new battery acid, which has a specific gravity, a specific amount of acid and water, you put that in there, you may wind up with too high a concentration of acid because you had acid that was in the plates and not in the water. Then you added more acid to it. Now you have an imbalance in the battery and its efficiency goes way down. Also remember that the chemicals and so on that uh, you find on the internet, oh, this will rebuild your battery, this will rejuvenate your battery, and so on. All of that stuff is bogus. None of it is real. Seems too good to be true? Yeah, it is too good to be true. Now some questions. All right, again from Quora. How do I release pressure from a car AC? Well, the way you would release pressure is by reducing the amount of refrigerant in it. Now, whoever you are, sir, you don't. If you were permitted by law to release refrigerant from an air conditioning system, you would have learned this procedure during your training to pass your test to get your license to work with mobile AC systems. Why is it, do you think, that the federal government, all state governments, and everybody in the world, they form these regulations for people to work on air conditioning systems? The reason is that we have global warming. We have depletion of the ozone layer, and on and on and on. And a lot of that is caused by air conditioning refrigerants. 
And where does it come from? Well, it doesn't come from professional shops, that's for sure. We have to keep logs of all the stuff that we do. We have to capture the refrigerant that we take out of an air conditioning system. And in order to do that, we have to buy expensive, I mean, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars at a pop, air conditioning recycling machines, refrigerant recycling machines. Now what that does, if we have too much, somebody has added too much, then we have to reduce the amount and our recycling machine uh, takes that in, recycles it so that we can reuse it in another car. It's a very complex machine. It's an expensive machine. You don't have it. So how could you do it? Well, you'd have to exhaust the refrigerant into the air, add to the air pollution. I'm certainly not going to tell you how to do that. Yes, I know lots of folks break the law. Lots of folks work on their own air conditioning system and they just don't care. Well, that's part of the problem we have these days. There's too damn many people that just don't care. It's all me, all the time. So please don't do it. All right. That's enough of my soapbox for the day. How much horsepower does an intercooler add? Well, intercoolers don't add a specific amount of power. Intercoolers add power based on a percentage, usually 5 to 10 percent. But 5 to 10 percent of what? The horsepower of the engine at sea level is going to be different than it is at 10,000 feet. So it's going to be 5 or 10 percent of something greater at sea level than it is at higher elevations. The horsepower of the engine is going to change with humidity and ambient air temperature and all of these different things. So on any given day, under any given circumstance, you could expect that an intercooler would add 5 to 10 percent of what the nominal horsepower output of the engine is on that particular day under that particular circumstance. All right, again from Quora, do auto mechanics realize they are in a dying industry with the onset of electric vehicles? Oh boy. Well, I truly did not know that and I'm extremely glad to find out. You know, it's kind of crazy to think that, well, I could be unemployed in a, in a week or two. I guess what I should do is I'll tell all my customers and my employees that, gosh, we're no longer needed. Then I guess the next thing would be would be to close our shops after all these years. You know, I started in this business when I was a freshman in high school. I've been uh, in the business for over 50 years. Ah, that's so disheartening to have somebody tell me that we're in a dying industry. Ah, I'm guessing my screwy math and understanding of this has been really seriously misleading me. You see, my math says that there are 280.5 million cars registered in the U.S. for 2021. 280.5 million cars. 1.8 million of those are electric vehicles. whoop de doo We are on a slippery slope here, folks, when it comes to internal combustion engines. Yeah, I want to see electric cars, too. I would like to own one. Now, all of the other 278.7 million of these vehicles are internal combustion, or ICEs. 
Now, with those numbers, your conclusions are, well, they're painfully obvious to me. Perhaps you know someone who, well, needs a ton of auto repair equipment or uh, whatever, you know, maybe the whole shop for, for that matter. I give a fire sale price, but keep in mind, most of this equipment that we use on internal combustion engine cars, we also use on electric cars, EVs. You see, it took a hundred years to develop the ICE. To think that IEV or fuel cell or anything will totally replace all of that in 10 years is a bit optimistic. Now that's from another reader on uh, Quora. My response to that is, now we did some math, I have to read this, we did some math and if there are a way to start crushing internal combustion engine cars today on a national basis, they could scrap approximately 27 million cars in one year. Now we have roughly 280 million cars on the road, so full-time scrapping would take 10 years minimum if, if everything worked perfectly. But that doesn't work. We're not going to be able to scrap all of those cars in 10 years because vehicle owners have equity in them. What are we going to do about the equity? Are we going to take their three-month-old car and run it through the crusher? Who's going to pay for it? You know, uh, there's sentimental issues with cars. There are people who have cars that don't have value, but it's their only method of transportation. We're going to take their car away so that they can't get to work? And what are we going to do? Are we going to give them a new electric vehicle? Are we going to uh, provide these uh, 50, 60, 80, $100,000 electric vehicles for the person who's driving around in a $35 hoopty, but they need it to get to work so that they can support their families? Somehow that doesn't ring true to me. Uh, so we have tens of millions of cars with value. Something has to be done about that. What about the cars that are potentially collectible? So you look at all of this. What about all of the legal aspects of disposing of all of the uh, ICE cars? You know, I understand and would love to see uh, all of this happen and happen in 10 years, but I don't personally think that it is even remotely possible to cover all of the hurdles of getting rid of those 287 million plus whatever we sell this year, uh, cars, ICE cars, on the road. So you could be looking at uh, quite a number of years for all of this to happen. Uh, but then there's another issue. If we were able to get rid of all of the internal combustion engine cars over the next 10 years, do we have the capacity to build 280 million replacement electric vehicles? No, we'd have to build the plants, we'd have to do all of these different things. You have to have the battery manufacturing capability. I mean, that's a lot of vehicles that you have to replace. And it's a lot of raw energy, it's a lot of raw materials and so on that have to be sourced, have to be delivered, have to be converted into vehicles. So yes, it's a great idea. Yes, I'm in favor of it. No, I don't think it can be accomplished. So there's my take on that. Uh, should I buy or repair? I have a 2008 Dodge Ram 
1500 Hemi that took a dive. Mechanic says 6K for remand engine and labor. Family friend that is a new car finance manager says the markup on vehicles combined with the lack of inventory justifies the repair. Well, maybe, maybe not. Whenever you're involved in a major repair like that, where you're going to spend thousands of dollars on the vehicle, it would make sense to have a whole car evaluation so that you know uh, the condition of the entire car. Because there's a lot more to a car than just an engine. Transmission, suspension. I mean, you could have major brake problems with ABS equipped cars and traction control and so on that could cost two, three thousand dollars additional just in brake work. So you have to have the car evaluated, all of the systems on the car, the cooling system, the uh, suspension, the brake system, the drive line in the car, the differentials and so on. All of this stuff needs to be evaluated to know what's bad right now and what's likely to go bad in the near future. Wouldn't it be a shame to spend six grand on this older truck and then find out three months down the road that you need a $3,000 transmission or maybe a $5,000 differential or uh, a transfer case or something like that. Well, you see, it pays to work from knowledge. And the way to get the knowledge to make that decision is to have the entire car diagnosed before you spend your money. Don't wait for things to happen after you've spent your money. Well, everybody, that has just about done it for this edition of Goss's Garage. Remember, if you want me to answer your questions, it's Pat Goss at goss-garage.com. And remember, there's no R in Goss. It's G-O-S-S. -S. Now, I may be gross, but that's not my name. And, uh, of course, check out our sponsors, uh, wins, winsusa.com, uh, rock auto, rockauto.com, and as always, enjoy your big bowl of fish head pudding. Drive gently, we'll see you next time right here in Goss's Garage.